Ask the Experts Q&A. We are joined today by Dr. Peter Leo and Megan Ott Lewis. Dr. Leo's calling in from Chicago at his practice. Um, I'm gonna get this wrong probably. Chicago Integrative Medical Center, close? Close enough. <laughs> It helps better when I have it in front of me. Um, and Megan is calling from the Philadelphia Children's Hospital. So welcome to both of you. Um, today is an opportunity for our community to ask all of those questions that they have and have not gotten answers or sufficient answers to, um, regardless of topic. So it doesn't have to relate to a specific webinar, which we have discovered is what our people want. So welcome, we're gonna give everyone a few more minutes to join us. It always takes a few minutes for everyone to get logged on. We don't wanna miss the important stuff. Um, while we wait, I'm just gonna share a little bit about NIA. The National Eczema Association is a nonprofit. We are run by a volunteer board of directors and scientific advisory committee which is filled with volunteer experts coming from all walks of the medical profession. And um, we were founded by patients and doctors. And we are here to support research, education, and awareness of eczema. Um, in June, we hope you will come and join us for the Eczema Expo, which is June 21st through 24th. We'll open on the 21st with a reception and registration and then get started early Friday, the 22nd with our very first session where you will get to see Dr. Leo again. So please come join us for that. Um, we are covering everything from the basics of eczema to the treatments and development, all of the important things you need to know about treatment and a ton of lifestyle information. So. How can food be accounted for? How can you exercise without flaring? How can you um, eat well to support your health? How can you share your story or advocate for better access? And all of these things are gonna be covered during the weekend. So we hope that you will come and join us. And I will tell you at the end again, but we do have a special code for anyone joining us today. If you go ahead and register anytime before the end of the weekend, Sunday the 15th, and use the coupon code ASK412, you will get $50 off your registration. So take advantage of that. All right, now that I think we're pretty good with people logging on, I'm gonna ask our speakers here to introduce themselves. Dr. Leo, do you wanna start? Sure, my name is Peter Leo. I am an assistant professor of clinical dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University in Chicago. I also am the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center, and I am a partner at Medical Dermatology Associates of Chicago. I've been interested in atopic dermatitis for a long time, and I feel like we're in this incredible phase where we're learning so much and so many new things about it that uh, it is an incredible time to be in, in this field and, and working on this. That's a fact. Megan? Hi, I'm Megan Lewis. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I see patients in the allergy clinic and I manage all of our allergy research studies. And I echo Peter's comments. It's a very exciting time in the field and I just love eczema and love helping families get better and, and maximize their quality of life. Wonderful, thank you both so much. And for those who don't know, I'm Carrie Gauthier. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the National Eczema Association, and I will be moderating your questions today. We have quite literally 10 pages of questions that came in in advance of today's session. Um, so we have selected a handful of those that we're gonna start off with, and we encourage you who are watching live to please feel free to submit any questions that you have You'll find it in your um, control panel for GoToWebinar, and you can submit questions. They will go through to our staff member here who will then um, collate them. So if several of you ask the same question, we'll only ask it once, um, and she'll bring them in. So um, probably at about, in about a half an hour is when we'll switch over to the live questions. So get those questions in as soon as possible. Let's get started. We're going to start off on a very common topic, 
people are constantly asking us, and I'm sure asking you guys, um, about how food affects their eczema. So I'll start with the specific question, but feel free to elaborate beyond this as well. I have uh, one woman who wrote in that her four month old breastfed son developed eczema all over. We've all heard that story before. Um, and she wonders what are the chances that it's related to food or environmental allergies? I'm sure she's thinking, what do I need to cut out of my diet to protect my son? So what would you tell this woman? Megan, do you want to start with that? I yeah, know you Megan work with food allergies. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so the challenge with food, the relationship of food and eczema is always something um, that is hard to, hard to figure out as a parent, I think. Um, eczema tends to show up around four to six months of age, which is when we start to introduce solid foods, which can sometimes complicate the picture a little bit. Um, most often, I would encourage that family to think about treating the skin first before adjusting the diet, because most of the time it's not a food that's triggering the eczema. In some cases, it can be a food, but all, every recommendation, every guideline suggests treating the skin first, and then we can think about adjusting the diet. Um, if, um, if the mother is interested in cutting back on some foods in her diet, I recommend always coming up with a plan to reintroduce it in the maternal diet again, because I have families that come in avoiding so, so many foods and it's unnecessary. So we want to keep mom healthy too, to be able to take care of that child and, and do all the skin care that we're recommending. Um, but try to treat the skin before assuming it's a food. Uh -huh. Peter, do you have some suggestions? Absolutely. So I think, you know, it often comes up, people say, have you ever thought about food? Could it be a food? And absolutely we do. I often say that we're not lucky in this regard. It would be so great if it was just a food or, or even a group of foods that triggered this. And I would argue and that for the lucky few people out there where they find some food that's triggering it, they stop it, and then they're better, well, they're so lucky, but the truth is they probably don't have eczema. They have a different disease. They have an eczematous food allergy. And so they're lucky because they can find their, their peace and, and avoid it. But for most of our patients, by definition, it's not just one thing. And so part of the problem is trying to tease out all these factors. Food can be a trigger for some people for sure, and we know there's this very intimate re relationship between atopic dermatitis and and food allergy, true food allergy, the kind where we know you're not cheating. You know, the, for example, peanut allergy, where if you eat a peanut, you're blowing up and having angioedema or maybe even anaphylaxis where you can't breathe. Nobody's cheating with that. So we know that people aren't, aren't you know, sneaking in a peanut here and there. And yet their eczema still is pretty bad. So this complex relationship has, has really been vexing for all of us because we're, we're trying to figure out what it is. We're trying to reassure families not to go too down that pathway because, of course, we've all seen patients and families where they've been so so strict with food that actually they've gotten sick. You can actually restrict the diet so much you're not getting what you need to survive. Um, and even in those cases, there was a famous case in Australia just a year or two ago where the baby was pretty much on death's door and what they found was that the eczema was still bad. So despite going on the most limited kind of strict diet you can, many times it does not seem to to play out. The interesting thing right now is that we've really turned a lot of this on its head in the past couple of years because We've been looking for foods that drive it for so long, but now we're starting to understand that having the eczema, having this leaky skin is maybe what's opening up the door for food allergies to get into the system, and that may be the actual order it's happening. Instead of food driving eczema, it may be that eczema is driving food, which has put more pressure than ever for us to say, we've got to get this skin under control, we've got to heal it so that we're not getting this, this uh, in, ingress of foods into the skin, which could potentially cause real allergies later. Mm -hmm. The tricky one to understand that chicken and egg effect, right? Um, that does lead me to a different question that was asked where another mom has a 10 year old daughter who has always had nut allergies. So presumably actually defined appropriately. Um, she's seeing an allergist and they're doing a peanut allergy desensitiza desensitization process <laughs> um, where of course they gradually feed her very tiny amounts of peanuts. And I think she's up to one peanut a day right now. Um, and her skin has been horrific through this process. So they're wondering whether or not they can say that it's the peanuts that are driving the eczema at this point, understanding that they have this food allergy and the desensitization is co coinciding with the severe eczema. 
Megan, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So, so a lot of times for these research protocols, there's very specific conclusion questions so that we didn't start someone on an oral immunotherapy protocol unless their skin was under really good control. So sometimes it's hard to tease out was it, again, was it the food or was it a skin flare that was happening? Um, from an allergy perspective, I was trying to think about all the other variables. Um, certainly, see that if that's the one thing that changed in her entire environment, um, it's something to think about, and she could work with her medical team about maybe keeping a, a brief pause in her daily Megan, can I interrupt for a second? Um, it, yeah. it sounds like your uh, audio is cutting out a little bit. Okay. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So can oh, maybe I'm sorry go about back that. a little bit. Okay. Um, I'll just move my phone closer to my desk here. Perfect. Um, Thank you. So, uh, so in food desensitization protocols, we typically want the skin to be really well controlled before we start um, start any immunotherapy. So I would recommend maybe talking with their medical team about ways to decrease, um, ways to maybe lessen the amount of peanuts the child's taking or to, um, or to, to maybe take a pause in the therapy process. You can't take too long of a pause, we know with OIT, but, um, but, but I would try to treat the skin before you adjust the foods. And think about seasonal components, think about detergents, think about fragrances, think about scented candles, all those things. Mm -hmm. So make sure it's not anything else first before you go straight to that it's the food causing Correct. it. Um, is it worth, or at what point is it worth getting tested for food allergies? So specifically someone asked about their two-year-old um, but is that a test that you guys would advise in relation to eczema or, or would you say, unless you're having a reaction that's anaphylactic or hives, don't go there? Um, so I'll, I'll start this one, Peter. The, um, the challenge with our testing that we have available for food allergies is that when you have eczema, your skin is already kind of in this inflammatory state. And so when we skin test someone, um, there's a much greater risk for false positives if we skin tested you. And maybe 10 years ago, if you came into the clinic, we would test to all sorts of things. Um, and we think we probably did a disservice to people um, because of the risk of false positives. So, um, so unless the skin is not getting any better and you have systemic symptoms, would we start to think about a food triggering the symptoms? I don't know, Peter, if you want to add anything. No, I totally agree. I think that's that's exactly right. And and that's part of what makes it so tricky that you have these multiple pieces kind of in play and it's hard to know is one causing one or are they just happening over time. So it it is it takes some it takes some work I think by the team and the family sometimes to try to figure it out and a lot of times I agree if we if we focus on getting things better we'll often get a better indicator, a better barometer if you will of what's actually happen on happening on the skin because sometimes if things are really inflamed, you can't tell what's triggering it sort of everything can trigger it at that point. It's sort of broken. So once we get things a little better, you can get a better sense. But I am a little bit more uh, open to food allergy testing now, especially now, you know, with, with wanting to introduce peanuts in particular early on, we know that all the kids with moderate or severe, particularly with severe, but even moderate if it started early, um, we want to have them tested before. So I think that it's kind of opened up the gates to doing it, even though I know it adds complexity for you guys. Uh, you now have to deal with all these patients and all these results that can be misleading and confusing, particularly in younger children. Mm. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, why don't we move on to a different topic? Um, we got a bunch of questions about best practices for steroids, of course, which is the first line treatment for most cases of eczema. Works for a lot of people, and we've also discovered that some people can react to it. So one person wrote in, and, and this is, a, I think, a great question because I think there's a lot of confusion around some definitions here. Um, and they said it's hard to differentiate between 
topical steroid withdrawal or addiction or red skin syndrome. So we've heard all of those names for that particular entity. Or is it a regular bout of inflammation triggered by something else? Um, how do you know how to best respond to flare-ups? Do you keep applying those steroids? How do you refrain from temporary use? All really great and really important questions. And I think uh, there is increasing awareness and sensitivity about TSW, this topical steroid withdrawal. I think um, I worry about it all the time, and I think that's the right place to start. We should be worried about it and, and really trying to avoid it. And so I think a good strategy in general is to be using steroids as more of an intermittent therapy. We want to hit, hit it hard for a little bit to pulse it, get things better. And then I really like my patients, whenever possible, to be steroid-free for a while then. And I, I usually feel like a good rule of thumb is half on and half off at the worst. So if you use your steroids for a week or two, then I want you to have a week or two off. If you use it for a few days, and at least a few days off. And if we can do that balance or better, some, you know, if we get them better, sometimes people say, well, I only needed my steroids two days last month, then we're in great shape. But if we can't, if we find that, gosh, as soon as I stop the steroids, I flare right back up, so I'm using steroids almost every day, we need to hit the brakes. We need to say this is not working for you. This is not a safe uh, plan to maintain on, and we need to, to go a different direction. Sometimes it means doing a total plan overhaul, trying to find every other little area we can help, a better moisturizer, a better bathing routine, wet wraps, uh, looking again for triggers. Uh, is there something that's driving this, something in the environment, maybe doing patch testing in addition to allergy testing, as well. Sometimes, for the more severe cases, it means now we have to use a systemic medicine or phototherapy. I have a lot of patients who will do light therapy then because we need to give them a break. But I think so long as we're communicating, watching the progression of the disease and making sure we're not spiraling out of control and overusing them, we should, in theory, be able to prevent the vast majority of cases. Um, that being said, uh, if we're not paying attention or we're not looking for it, I think it's true these cases can slip by and then we have real trouble. And then once it's there, to answer the second part of the question, it is really hard to tell. I don't have a good, reliable way. Uh, some of the things I look for for TSW is particularly that, that flushing, blushing look, often on the face and neck, even if they've just used the steroids on the body. Sometimes you'll still see it on the face and neck. Sometimes it looks a little bit like rosacea. So when I see any of those features, if I hear burning, burning skin rather than just itchy, all those things make me think maybe we're heading towards there. Uh, so if I inherit a patient with that, I'm going to try to do everything I can to minimize steroids uh, or avoid them completely. But it is a huge challenge because when you really look at it, it's a, you say, what are our other options? Our non-steroidal options are fairly limited. They're much more expensive in general, and they have their own sets of side effects, sometimes stinging and burning, sometimes you know, the potential black box warning on, on tacrolimus and pimicrolimus. So we, we really, unfortunately, we're a little bit in a corner, but the good news is we have new developments coming. And so I think in the next few years, we're going to really be able to open this up. Great. Um, so you, you talked about sort of the 50-50 concept. Um, is, is that what you consider best practices? I mean, in terms of, I, I've heard different things, you know, that you shouldn't, you should be on them for no more than four to six weeks. You should, you know, and then of course there are these stories, just like you said, I, one of the questions we got was exactly that, um, you know, that they're on a steroid. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> They're on a steroid, um, it heals, but as soon as the steroid is stopped, it comes back. And, um, yeah. you know, they can extend it a little bit using Lipicar, but not by much. And so, okay, so yeah, that would be worrisome to me. That's that's a red light situation. That's We gotta do something different. We have to really rework that. Um, right, I think, you know, from from a lifetime standpoint, I, I, I think to say something like you can only use them six weeks in your life is probably not realistic for most of these patients. Um, I would love it. I'd love not to need them at all, right? I mean, I always, I always try to remind people that we don't, we don't advertise. There's no advertisements for me. I'm not on the street saying, you need some steroids. Like, I hate them. I don't want to use them. But I love them when they give huge relief and help us break the cycle. And the best days of my life are when people come back and they say, I'm doing so great. I haven't had a flare-up in six or eight weeks. I lost the steroid cream. Uh, do you mind calling in a refill just in case I need it? I'm like, 
you're you're perfect. You're that's what I want. I want you not to know where it is. You haven't needed it. Legitimately haven't needed it. But I worry when I hear a story like that where someone needs it a lot. So it's just that's the hard part. Just trying to balance that art and science because again, I think as we said earlier in the last question, if you let the eczema rage, some people are going to get better over time. It's true. You know, I think if you just didn't treat it at all, eventually people will probably get better. It could be months. It could be years. Um, they're going to have ups and downs. They might have some really good weeks and some bad weeks. But um, but I don't think it's good. I think it's a bad place to be if you're scratching your skin and rubbing your skin and not sleeping well and have open oozing areas. Uh, and all it takes is a couple bad infections. You know, and I have patients who've literally waited to see me three or four months. They've not used anything steroidal and the eczema is raging and they say we need help we're not sleeping everything's miserable we had an infection you know all this kind of bad stuff happening and so at that point you have to ask yourself okay this is pretty bad they're they're suffering a lot i want to relieve this suffering is it worth the risk of using a topical steroid carefully and appropriately i think the answer is yes right now but i hope in the future there'll be other options where we'll say nope we don't need to do that we have better things that are non-steroidal megan what do you think yeah i i completely agree i think that um, while it, it feels scary to use the steroids, it, it is the best treatment that we have, and we do have to use them sometimes in a lot of people. And um, some, the, the only other thing I would add, Peter, is that sometimes we'll use scheduled application if there's a spot, like if you know the inner arms always flare, you could apply um, your steroid cream twice a week or, or Wednesdays and Sundays, whenever it works for you, to try to limit how often you're using it, but also to prevent the flare from coming on. And sometimes that, while it's debated in the, in the academic centers, I think it can help reduce the overall need for steroid creams too, to kind of prevent the flare from coming on. That might be one other way to help reduce how much steroid you need. That's a great point. So Megan, are you, um saying that there are maybe some cases that it's almost used preventatively somewhat? Correct, yeah. I mean, the mainstay is moisturizer. So moisturize, moisturize, moisturize at least twice a day. Uh, if you're needing steroid creams, I think you should be moisturizing at least that much. Um, if it's a baby, I say every diaper change. If, if it's possible and feasible, I know that's easier said than done. When babysitting my nieces and nephews, I understand that's not so easy. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the other part of your question. Um, just if if you mean it to be used preventatively and and sort of the um, what the circumstances of that might might be where it's you're not then seriously risking this TSW situation sure. in the long run. So so you're moisturizing all the time, and then I would also um, if you're able if you know that there's you know, if there's parts of the body that always flare, for instance, the hands, I know we're going to get to some hand questions shortly, but then I would think about maybe wearing, um, putting the topical steroid on twice a week or three times a week to prevent it from getting to that point of cracks or open or oozing, as Peter talked about, um, to prevent that flare from getting worse and needing even stronger topical steroids, because sometimes we can maintain with a lesser potent steroid to treat it without having to go to bigger therapies. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that, Peter? No, I think that's that's really it, and I think it just it's good to keep awareness up. Everyone needs to work together, and I think we really want to work so that we dispel the notion that it's just steroid phobia. We're not trying to be dismissive about that, but we also want to get people better and over the hump. And then sometimes there is a little bit of a risk to take. So we're trying to we're threading a needle. It's not it's not pretty. It's art and science for sure. Yeah, definitely. So you kind of addressed um, that there are these challenging areas of the body. So someone asked, what are the best means to treat the soft skin areas? So like the face, hands and neck, um, where the chronic use of steroids can really be potentially detrimental in the further thinning out of the skin. Is there a go-to that you guys have in terms of best, best treatment for that? I like low potency there. And then as Megan was saying, you know, the the ability to potentially do a scheduled application or sometimes we'll call it a proactive therapy, a maintenance type plan. And for me, one of the things I like is to use a non-steroidal there. So the tacrolimus or pimacrolimus, our calcineurin inhibitors, or even the newer medicine, the chrysoborol, I really like those because they can they can help. Now, the problem is they, they each have their own setbacks. They're not perfect. But if we can use them effectively, they can really replace for some people or at least really 
minimize the need for steroids, especially in those sensitive areas. Mm-hmm. And of and course, so I'm interested in all moisturize. <laughs> moisturizers, of course. And you know, I like the alternative medicines, so I'll often use you know some of the different types of oils. I like coconut oil. I like sunflower seed oil. Um, I like certain types of bath preparations too that can help. All these other little things, anything we can do to sort of minimize the need for medicine. And sometimes people laugh at that. They'll be like, "Oh, it barely helps. It helps a little." But I say, "Okay, but if we get." 10 tiny things that help a little, that can sometimes make a big difference. Uh, agreed. It's not going to, you know, coconut oil is not going to cure eczema. I can promise you that unless you're the mildest of all. But as part of a plan and the right patient, it might minimize it. It might help you need, you know, less some other medicines, which is the goal. Sure. Let's move on to some other um, triggers and environmental allergies. A great question came in. Um, we know that triggers aren't always immediate. So if your skin does not react to a trigger immediately, how do you actually know when something is a trigger since there may be a delayed response? Megan, you want to start us off? Yeah, this is where I think eczema becomes so challenging for families. I think um, you you have to almost become a detective and you can make yourself crazy trying to think of all the different triggers. Um, I use the, the body pattern where it's showing up can tell you a lot. So if it's only on the areas that are exposed to say the carpet or the outside, so like just the lower arms and the lower legs, you could think about some um, variables uh, in the environment that could be impacting. If it's all over, then I would think about maybe something like a detergent or um, thinking about switching to all cotton clothes can make a difference. Um, But I, I would say that if you're doing good skincare, if you're treating the skin appropriately, then it's time to start to think about some other things in the environment. We talk about pet dander a lot in my clinic, um, and, and it can really, by limiting pet dander with good vacuuming and, and limiting the dander in the place where the child sleeps, it can really make a difference for eczema control. So I think that is really important to think about, and sometimes a hard topic when the pet is a, is a very important family member. So. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to jump, actually. We got a great question about um, a pet allergy. Let me find it. <laughs> There's someone with a cat allergy that um, they determined from some type of allergy testing. Um, Oh, here we go. Um, They're, of course, waiting to see an allergist, um, but they had a blood test done, and it indicated that um, he was highly allergic to cats. But there are no obvious symptoms itchy, watery eyes, breathing difficulties, hives. So how could this blood test coming back be impacting the eczema when it doesn't seem to be a standard allergy the way we would usually define it? I I think that this this kind of highlights what we talked about earlier. Our testing isn't that great. So um, blood testing, because you have eczema, you have more circulating IgE. So you have more of a risk of false positives. So if you're not having overt symptoms around the cat, um, it's, it's certainly something to think about, but I wouldn't, um, we don't have to get rid of the cat immediately, but sometimes it can help if you remove the cat from the environment or if they go to their grandparents' house or someone else's house without the dander to try to eliminate the dander exposure for a week or two weeks if that's feasible. Um, that can help really show if the cat dander is making a difference on the eczema. Um, but but the blood testing is 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 false that you know if we tested the general population lots of us would come up positive to those things without having symptoms to it so um, it just shows the need i think we're getting better with allergy testing Uh, i think there's some new treatments and therapies on the horizon both for um, allergy and for eczema but um, we're not there yet and that's the challenge with that blood test is that um, just full of false positives peter having heard your um, presentation a few times I know you're, you mentioned it earlier, the leaky skin concept. Could this be factoring into a situation like this where internally it appears that there's an allergy because of the eczema, but it's not that the allergy is causing the eczema, the eczema is causing the appearance of the allergy? Absolutely. I mean, again, so this whole concept that these are related, deeply and intimately related, but maybe one's not causing the other, or at least the way we think it is. So you can certainly have other allergies that 
you know, may or may not be contributing to your eczema. And it's even possible, as you say, that the eczema itself is what's making you it's giving the predilection to these allergies. Um, there's no doubt that a lot of things can also be nonspecific triggers. So the other piece is, you know, as Megan says, the testing isn't great. It isn't perfect. It's, it's helpful. But one of the things it can miss is just the concept of things that are inflammatory or irritating. You know, you're not really allergic to this, for example, say a certain kind of fabric that's scratchy say a fragrance, you might not actually have fragrance allergy, but it's just irritating to your skin, and that's enough to set you off. Um, and the same is true for certain foods. I believe that certain foods are really inflammatory foods. It's a little controversial, but I think you can test negative for wheat or gluten allergy. So it looks like you're not, you're not really allergic to it, but when you eat it, it pushes your body into a little bit more of an inflammatory state. And so that, I think, can explain some of the reason why when people make dietary changes, they often get a little bit better. They're not cured because it's not the underlying cause is just one of the triggers. And so if you feel that, you know, one of those things is making a difference, it can be helpful. But, you know, it may not be that the dog is what's causing your eczema. But boy, if your eczema is even a little bit inflamed, being around the dog dander could be enough to help make you have a miserable weekend when you're there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, this moves perfectly into the next question. Um, they're asking, are allergy shots or the under the tongue allergy treatments effective in treating eczema? Can you talk about that connection there and what the benefit is? Yeah, so allergy immunotherapy has been around for a very long time. What we had for a long time was subcutaneous. So it's the shots that you um, years ago used to give at home, but, but now we recommend they be given in an allergy or primary care office. Um, they are highly effective at treating allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. Um, and in some people, it can really help their eczema. We think of allergies kind of like a, a pot. And if you have so much allergen intake, once you've gotten so much, you're overflowing. If we can take your threshold down a little bit through immunotherapy, it will help you not to kind of have those systemic profuse symptoms. Um, so it can help with eczema, but in other patients, it can make eczema worse. So we're really careful when we start someone who has atopic dermatitis, we're always watching for the eczema to get worse. And some people, um, we have to take off the shots because it just isn't effective or it makes their eczema flare. So that's a good discussion to have with your allergist and, and, and think about if you're a candidate. Um, the shots are an option, they're time consuming, um, but now we have sublingual tablets. They're approved for 12 and up for different um, single allergens um, where it's a tablet you put under your tongue. And I would presume there's not as much data on the relationship between eczema and, and sublingual immunotherapy or split. Um, but I would assume it's the same process that it could irritate your eczema in some patients. Peter, do you agree? Absolutely. Great. Um, you mentioned phototherapy as an alternative treatment. I know it's been really beneficial to a lot of people. Uh, are there any adverse effects to long-term phototherapy? There are. There are a couple things. In the short term, it definitely can cause a burn. So you can see a a pretty bad sunburn if you're not careful. Uh, Some people, it's pretty small, probably less than 5% actually can worsen with the phototherapy, and that's no good. So we want to be on the lookout for that. And then longer term, we think it really takes years to get to this point. But if you're on it continuously for years, you do have an increased risk of skin cancer. Um, They're usually not the dangerous type, not usually melanoma risk. It's usually squamous cell or basal cell risk, but it's still there. Um, It's a pretty small amount, and we mostly see it in our psoriasis patients who are doing it long term. We think that for our atopic dermatitis patients, they tend to use it much more intermittently, maybe three to six months, and then they often have a vacation from it. So I feel the risk is pretty low, especially when we compare it to the other things we're talking about for those patients. And so generally, the risk-benefit analysis is really good. But the other big thing is time. It takes time to come in. You have to come in two to three times a week, and it can be expensive. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, coverage is okay, but the copays are really high. And if you have a high deductible plan, then you're paying the, all this money into it. And that can be it can just be a big burden for families unfortunately yeah absolutely we definitely hear about the burden of cost quite frequently in many regards to eczema um oof, here's a tough one you guys i'm allergic to every moisturizer over the counter and prescription what can i use um, so that's interesting. If, if you're really, really allergic, that's that's rare, I would say, to be allergic to everything. I wonder if, if they've had 
patch testing to really help us figure it out because they might be allergic to a lot of them. Maybe there are a couple of common ingredients that they're allergic to, like propylene glycol or one of the preservatives. So it could be worth testing to help us find out. But if they really are allergic to seemingly everything, one thing it's really hard to be allergic to is plain, pure petroleum jelly. Uh, and that comes in a few different ways. One of the ways to do it is hydrolated petrolatum, where they kind of whip it with water. Uh, it's pretty inert. It's what we actually put the patch test stuff in. So it's we kind of know even in the most allergic people, it's basically it's in a petroleum base. That stuff just sits on the skin. It doesn't bother you. So something like that would be fine. Another thing some people like to use would be beef tallow, kind of the beef fat. Um, it's sort of an animal product. Uh, it smells a little bit funky. It smells like beef or steak, but um, uh, it's interesting in that it's it's very in inert uh, and it's very different than other other types of moisturizers. If you're allergic to beef, you wouldn't want to do it, but um, and that can happen, of course, but because it is an animal product, but something like that could work. Uh, other patients find using something like just a plain pure coconut oil, again, as long as they're not allergic to that, that could be helpful. Um, things like that. So I would I would kind of I'd like to pursue that a little bit more. It's very rare to be truly be allergic to everything, although some people have intolerance. They don't tolerance to this. They don't like the feel of a lot of things on their skin. And there maybe something like one of the spray-on moisturizers uh, could help. Maybe uh, an in-bath or in-shower type moisturizer could be helpful for them too. They kind of wash with it and sort of uh, leave it on and sort of just gently pat dry at the end. And so that that's all they need. Mm -hmm. Megan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what you uh, suggested. Um, I know sometimes if, if financial issues are a problem, using plain old Crisco to as an emollient, um, not not endorsing Crisco by any means, it's just the only uh, one I can think of, but um, but but really the petrolatum is, is the way that we would recommend um, to help seal in the moisturizer. But again, I, I echo everything you said about it being very, very rare for that to be the case. Great. Um, you mentioned patch testing, and I know that's something that comes up a lot in our world here at NIA. Um, and doesn't seem to be accessed as frequently. A lot of people have just the prick test. Can you guys maybe address how someone would go about determining if they should do a patch test? How, you know, who should they talk to about it? Um, what should they say if they believe they need it? Megan, you start us off. Yeah, maybe start with like the allergy pathway and doing the skin prick and serology and then how you might think about it after that. Yeah, so I think um, if, we, if we're worried about some kind of environmental trigger, the, bit, the best thing we could do is start with skin testing as long as their skin is clear enough to test. Um, in someone who has really diffuse eczema, sometimes we'll do the blood work, but typically we'll wait and try to do skin testing. Um, if we are unable to identify a trigger, often I switch the moisturizers around. We know that certain moisturizers can have, um, sometimes if the moisturizer has a lot of preservatives in it or more ingredients, it can lead the way for more irritation. So limit the number of ingredients in the product that you're using. Um, and I try to switch around a lot. Um, we don't offer patch testing in my office. We do that in collaboration with our dermatology colleagues. Um, so, so it's not often first in my, in my wheelhouse, but it is time consuming. Um, so Peter, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, so I think that's that's a great point because many patients will start with the allergist with the skin prick testing. That's the one where you get little pokes in your back uh, or on your arms, and you're basically watching for a short period of time, minutes to hours, to see if you get a hive reaction. So that's going to help us know the kind of environmental allergens that could be a trigger that could uh, cause cause the type of allergic reaction that's immediate, like a hive type response. So those are helpful. But the hard part is that many of those um, could be a trigger for the eczema, but they won't get to the ones that cause an eczematous reaction. And so that's really where the patch testing comes in. And the hard part about patch testing is it's much harder to do. Uh, very relatively few people do it. So you have to find a center. You have to find someone who's comfortable doing it. And the way that one works is it's a slow process. You come Usually you come in on a Monday and we clean the back really well. We put all these different allergens in these little, they're called a fin chamber, a little metal disc, and they're all over your back. We do 80. Uh, some people do even more. You can hear people do over 100. And so we pick 80 of the common, it's called the North American Standard uh, set, and then you put this tape on their back, they leave it on Monday night, 
Tuesday. They come back Wednesday. We peel it off. You can imagine you're kind of itchy and uncomfortable. You haven't had a shower in a couple of days. That's the initial reading. And then you have to be careful with your back for two more days. And then on Friday, we do what's called our final read. And what we're looking for is to see an eczema reaction. So it takes a few days to kick in. That's why you have to leave it on for a while and wait in those spots. And so this kind of reaction is not a hive reaction. It's something that you wouldn't notice unless you were doing something usually over time, but that's where we find things like stuff in shampoos, stuff in preservatives, stuff in our topical treatments. And there's no doubt I've had patients where I go, oh my gosh, you're allergic to a preservative and it's in the moisturizer I'm having you use. And I'm thinking, oh golly, so I'm contributing to this problem. But um, it is difficult to do pre correctly. You need to have the right person. It's expensive. All those allergens cost a fortune and all the time put in. So it, it does take a little bit more work. And that's why I try to do it when I can, or when somebody's, particularly when someone's not responding. So that's really, that's really where I try to do it, or if it looks very suspicious that there's an allergen on the skin. But um, I get a little bit defensive. Some of my colleagues who do, do it, I, and we do it in our office, but some people who are kind of really gurus and focus on it, they'll make Make a big point. Everybody should have it, practically everybody with eczema. And I just push back a little. I say, gosh, it's just not practical. It's expensive. It's time consuming. It's really difficult in children. So I don't think it's fair to say that this is mandatory before you do anything else. And, and in truth, um, although we often find positive allergens, just like with the food discussion and our other discussions, it is extremely rare that we'll find the, the allergen that explains everything and we stop it and they're clear. Much, much, much more commonly, 90, I would say 98% or 99% of the time, Mike's Experience, we just find things that may be contributing but aren't the total cause. The ones, the one or two percent where we go, oh my goodness, this really is it. Those are dramatic, and those are celebration. Everybody's dancing around. People, you know, get so excited, and uh, we we fix it. But those are pretty rare. So we we want to be careful. We don't want to get false hope and put people through that unnecessarily. Sure. Um, you mentioned that sometimes it is an allergy to something in these products. So we have someone specifically that they had allergy testing done and they determined they were allergic to, bear with me on this pronunciation, methylisothiazolinone. <laughs> Yep, that methyl isothiazolinone. Yeah, and methyl chloral isothiazolinone. Those are two really common allergens. We abbreviate them MI and MCI because those names are a mouthful. They are super duper common. They are present in a lot of stuff. And one of the, the insidious ways that people get exposed to them is through paper products. So wipes, diaper wipes, and a lot of people are using wet wipes nowadays. It's sort of one of the things I think that's become more popular. You see them at Costco, the big old flushable wet wipes. Um, it's in the paper. So sometimes as patients say, well, no, I got the ones that are just water. They're super gentle. But I say, no, 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 it's not not that they're bathed in the chemical, the chemical's part of the paper. And so this is a real bad one, and it's in, it's in a ton of products. So MCI and MI are big, big issues for us uh, that we have to face a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is a question um, you guys may be familiar. Of course, Nia has the Seal of Acceptance program where we work with companies, they go through a testing process and it's determined that they don't have certain ingredients in them and they're created for people with sensitive skin or eczema. And if they meet the criteria and pass the testing, they can use our seal, right? So we get people asking this question quite frequently. Um, this person who is has this allergy um, says that it's, for this particular one and some others as well, um, it seems to be a recognized problem in Europe, but not here in the US. Um, so do you guys have any, how do you, I mean, I guess the question I wanna ask based on this is, how do you as an individual um, talk about it that's safe and approved here, but you're seeing that in other countries it's, it's not? That is a common problem. Megan, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, so I'm not as familiar with the international approval process as, as you are, but I, you know, when I have a family that's new to eczema, new to the diagnosis, grandparents or aunts and uncles want to help and do what they can, I do kind of steer them towards those products just because someone else has tried them, someone else has kind of vetted them. And, and, and when you go to the to you know, online marketplaces, or if you go to any store, it's overwhelming the number of eczema products that are available. So having some guidance to look for that seal can really help kind of help families find a coupon for that product that has the seal 
um, can really make a difference. I, I'm, I'm, I'm less familiar with the international approvals, though, Peter. Are you? I mean, yeah, you know, things like this do come up where something, you know, particularly in the world of sunscreens, there are many sunscreen ingredients that we use here in the U.S. that are not used uh, in Europe. I would argue that in general, European standards are a little bit more stringent. They they tend to just are, cut things out that maybe we'll be a little more tolerant of. That being said, it's really two different questions. I actually don't think MCI and MI is unsafe, right? I think that it's probably pretty bland as far as these preservative type chemicals go. It's just that it has unfortunately become an allergen. So like anything else, the allergen, you know, the ability to become an allergen doesn't really mean that it's not, not an okay ingredient. It just means that for some reason it's triggering this in certain people. So, um, you know, anything can be an allergen basically to, to some extent. So we're testing for these 80 things and they're common because they're in a lot of products. So it may just be the reason it's become more common as an allergen is because it's become more common in products because it's a good preservative. That being said, the marketplace is so sensitive. And this is one of the nice things about being in the U.S. We have so many options and people are really sensitive to this. So when the parabens uh, whole controversy came out, we feel the parabens are probably safe. They really probably got a bad rap, um, on, unfortunately fortunately and unnecessarily, but a lot of patients just said, I don't want them. And so companies responded. They said, fine, we're just going to switch gears and we're going to just stop using them. So that was great. And so for some patients, I don't even have to have the conversation. I just say, you know what, let's just pick a parabens free. Even though I think it's safe, you're worried about it. We can skip it. Same for MCI and MI. And then for patients with multiple allergens, that's why we have this great database. So when a patient comes and gets patch testing, I punch in all of their allergens. This database goes through thousands and thousands of products and gives them a safe list. So I literally can give you a list and say, okay, these products are okay for you to use. They've been cross-checked and they don't have any of the allergens or any of their cross-reactors. So here's, you know, 20 moisturizers you can use or here's 20 shampoos and conditioners you can use. And that's the best part of the visit because otherwise it's a little overwhelming. You're like, how am I going to go through every product that I touch and make sure it doesn't have these long chemical names? It's really daunting. But when you do this, then you really go the other way. Is that uh, the card database that you're referring to? Yeah, there's there's a car database. The one we use actually here is called the Camp database, but they're both really they're both great. There's a number of of different systems. So as I understand it, people can only get access to their patients, I should say, can only get access to it if they've been tested and they're connected to it through their doctor. Correct. I believe that's right because they're expensive to maintain and so the way we get access to it is by being members. We pay a bunch of money to be a member of the society and then that allows us to search it for our patients. Uh -huh. So the good news that I'm going to share with you guys and everybody watching is that we are actually very actively working on updating our SEAL database. So it won't be quite as extensive as the card or, or camp databases where you can cross check, but you will actually be able to search and exclude by ingredients. So you will be able oh, to say, fabulous. I don't want anything with this Great. ingredient. And you'll get all of the SEAL products that don't have it. So that expect that in a couple months to hopefully deal with some of this. <laughs> That's that is fabulous, yeah. Um, all right, let's get back to our questions. I, I have had my staff member bring in three more pages of questions, so I don't think we're going to get to all of them. But um, in the last 12 minutes, let's see what we can get to. We got a lot of questions on hand eczema. Um, the challenges of it, that things, nothing seems to work. Um, often it's, not just one type of eczema, it could be dyshydrotic, it could be contact, it could be atopic, you name it, it could be all three. Um, can you guys just talk a little bit about if someone comes into you with really bad eczema, hand eczema and nothing seems to be working, how do you help them? What advice do you give? So I'll start. Um, so I think hand eczema is one of the hardest things for families. It's really hard to treat. The skin on your hands is thicker than other parts of the body. So, um, so a lot of times I'll, I'll talk with the families about thinking about any day-to-day -day triggers that could be going on, like if they're wearing gloves. Um, certainly if they're healthcare workers, we can talk, of, talk about something different. But, you know, what kind of gloves they're wearing for the winter. Um, I'm looking forward to warmer weather in Philadelphia, but um, we need, I think it will help with some people's hand eczema, not everyone's, but um, a lot of times we talk about emollient use and cotton gloves, like wet, damp cotton gloves um, in the evening to really help hydrate that skin and then applying the topical steroid. And really you have to use a stronger topical steroid than you might need on other parts of the body um, to get through that thicker skin. 
uh, you want to use it with caution and not overuse it as we've talked about already in this presentation but um, but hand eczema is really hard but helping the families to identify triggers I send um, if if you're uh, able you can get little travel size emollients to keep in the desk or in their pocket at school so they can keep applying a moisturizer every time they wash their hands to help kind of rep repair that barrier um, Peter I don't know if you want to talk about some of your thoughts too no, I think that's a great, great way to put it, that it's one of the toughest things for patients and families um, because we use our hands all day long. They are in everything. You know, we touch all these different things, and it can be really hard to know. If they're not doing well with the basic care, I think hand eczema is one of the big points where we want to do allergic contact dermatitis patch testing. So patch testing for hand dermatitis is often very fruitful. Um, the other big area is eyelid. If you have eyelid dermatitis, that's we often say it's the canary in the coal mine. You probably are touching something or getting exposed of something and that skin is very sensitive. So uh, definitely patch testing is important. Um, light therapy really helps. So the phototherapy, we have a special hand unit where you can just put your hands on there. That can really help uh, and help bring some of the inflammation down. But there's no doubt some of the hand eczema and hand dermatitis patients can be so severe that they actually can go on disability. And so we really have to be aggressive to get these people comfortable and back to life. I mean, can you imagine your, your eczema is so bad that you cannot work? And this happens, you know, every, every month or two I have somebody who's that severe, and so we'll escalate pretty quickly. We'll use one of the systemic agents or even dupilumab, the new shot, to get things under control if the basics aren't working. But usually, really being careful, uh, cautious about moisturizing your hands every time you do wash, using the appropriate kind of cleanser, because people forget too, they go travel, they go in the airport, and they know they're allergic or they know their hands react to the soap and they forget all about it. They go to the bathroom, they wash with the gross airport soap and now you've just covered your hands in that. And then when we talk about that, they say, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. So you kind of have to get a little compulsive, carry your own soap with you, carry moisturizer with you, be really, really careful. Uh, and most patients, we can help. You know, it sounds dire, but almost everybody, we can get significantly better and back in action. Uh -huh. Great. It's a tough one, especially with kids. I've seen a couple people submitted kids who are dealing with it and I mean it sounds like it's going to be the same regardless of age that you you've got to look for those those specific Very triggers much. um oh this is this is a good one their four-year-old daughter refuses to put on any lotions or creams when she's awake due to having had a bad experience she complained of burning mm -hmm. anyone who's ever been around a kid knows how stubborn they can be how can you encourage a child that young or of any age to put on something that they've had a bad experience with willingly? It's, it's so hard. And, and um, I think a st there's nothing more challenging than a stubborn toddler in some cases. Um, and they really, we have to get the moisturizer on their skin. So if the first thing I would do is empower the parents that um, this might be a two person job but it just has to get done. Um, the only way to treat that skin is to get something on it. So sometimes a reward chart or some kind of behavior modification can help to, um, you know, to help make it a less, a more enticing option to, to put the moisturizer on the skin. A lot of times I'll recommend putting the moisturizer in the fridge because that cooling sensation can kind of um, distract and almost offer a placebo effect to distract the child. Um, sometimes putting it in like a cool jar or something kind of novel or exciting, you could dump the emollient into something that the child might be excited about. Um, and having the child help you put it on, have them put it on their sibling, make it a kind of a family activity to help make it less scary. But, um, mm. uh, you know, sometimes bathing can be a fight. So you can put the child in the bath in their cotton pajamas just so uh, it can kind of distract and pr provide a little placebo effect um, to help with, with um, those bath time fears. I don't know, if, Peter, if you have some other tricks. Those are all great tricks. I think, yeah, I would I would be cautious about putting on the same exact moisturizer that burned before. I mean, A, because it may, right. may well burn again, there could be a reason, and B, the child, if they've seen it, they know that's the one, so I'd definitely switch it up. If it was in a pump, I'd get a jar. If it was in a jar, I might get something, you know, totally different in a, in a cream base, and we really want to pick ones that definitely won't sting. I kind of have a little group of ones that I'm 
you know, 99% sure are not going to sting. One of the ones we mentioned before, that hydrolated petrolatum, Vaseline basically whipped with water, that one shouldn't sting or burn. Um, some of the oils won't sting or burn. And so we, we know, like, you can put a little bit of a, of a natural oil, mineral oil or coconut oil on the skin. Many patients find that really soothing. Um, and we'll even do that before bath. People that don't want to go in the bath, they can actually oil up first, then get in the tub, and that actually kind of takes some of that sting from the water out of it. But, yeah, finding the right thing, trying little areas first instead of just slathering somebody with it. You pick a little bit of a, of a spot on their wrist, make sure it feels good, and I'll often do it in, in the clinic. I'll take the, the kid's hand and I'll say, let's put this on you. How does that feel? And I watch them, you know, and so long as they feel it feels good, it feels good, then I say, okay, let's do a little more. And so then we know they have the buy-in and they feel comfortable with it uh, because, right, if you, you burn the bridge, then we're in trouble. Sometimes they don't want to put medicine on either, and that, that can be a real problem. Mm-hmm. Great. Those are some great tips. Um, do you guys have any recommendations to help cope with neuropathic itch? Neuropathic itch is really hard. You know, we know that there's a lot of science being done right now, both in terms of peripheral nervous system, what's happening in the skin, but also central nervous system in the brain. There are changes. And one of the difficult things about this is that it really is a different pathway. The itch itself is different than the inflammation, uh, than the bacteria, than the moisturizer, all the things we're thinking about. The itch is sort of, it's, it's the lone wolf. So right now, I would argue we don't have great things. What we try to do is we try to get the eczema under control, get that inflammation under control, break those cycles, and let the nerve endings settle down by themselves. And that's sort of our best bet. Some patients do find that if we treat the nerve endings directly, for example, with Promoxine, which is an over-the-counter numbing agent. So there are a few products that have it uh, built in. So for example, CeraVe Itch Relief has Promoxine built in. Uh, Vino has an anti-itch that also has Promoxine. So these are th ways to kind of soothe the nerve endings by literally shutting them off. That can help. Um, Sometimes for certain types of neuropathic itch, we can use more powerful systemic agents like gabapentin, which has a nerve calming effect. So it actually works centrally and kind of cools things down, which is very nice. We also have little concoctions. We can make up a special mixture of a couple of things, again, that will help cool the nerve endings down. And so things like that, and we know that in research phase right now, there are a few different new anti-itch treatments coming out. One is uh, a medication called... Um, Serlopatant. And Serlopatant is used, it's a cousin of a medicine used for nausea. It turns out that the nausea pathway and the itch pathway are kind of similar. And so there's just studies, they're just publishing sort of the early studies on this. It's not approved yet, but we're all hoping, boy, wouldn't this be neat if this drug comes out? It works by uh, inhibiting a, a, a molecule called NK1, neurokinin 1. So if this works, this would be a potential way to help with the itch. And then there's another group of medicines out, these IL-31, interleukin-31 inhibitors. These are biologic agents. They'll be shots, but they may have an effect on itch as well because this IL-31 seems to drive itch in some patients. So we are at the beginning of understanding itch, and so it's really exciting that we finally have some leads, and we'll see where this goes. Those drugs might all fail. You know, we know that we get excited about something, and then it turns out oh, it didn't, didn't pan out. So uh, that's why we can't say much right now, but hopefully as we learn more about it, we're going to have new ideas. Great. Wonderful. Um, I think one last question, and then we'll we'll close it down. Um, what is your opinion on the fungal relationship to eczema? This person noticed that whenever they take Diflucan for a yeast infection, that their facial eczema improves drastically, um, but it doesn't last more than a month. That's a real condition. This um, this head and neck eczema is particularly in young adults, is where we see it. Uh, there's a whole literature that this may have something to do with malassezia yeast and that this yeast overgrowth is part of what's driving it. And I actually do uh, feel this is important for a group of patients. And so that makes a lot of sense. Part of it is then, you know, how do we keep it away? So sometimes we'll do the fluconazole or antifungal pill systemically once every week or two to keep it at bay. Other times we can actually switch to a topical anti-yeast shampoo or, you know, some kind of a cleanser that will help. Help. And for a group of patients, it can be huge. And we think that there's some imbalance where the yeast is overgrowing and the immune system is getting mad about it. So it ends up being kind of a trigger. Megan, have you seen that, the head and neck dermatitis in young adults? I haven't seen it. I've just read about it in the literature. I haven't seen, we see mostly kids in my practice and adolescents, but we don't see it too often. But, but I have heard and, and, and it can be really hard for, for patients. Definitely. So would that be more... Um... I mean, maybe not 
de defined as such, but more similar to seborrheic seborrheic dermatitis, where you it, then follow those yes. treatments. And it it can look a lot like it too. So that's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm evaluating those patients. They get more flaking, scaling. They get a little bit more scalp involvement sometimes. Uh, one of my favorite pearls is if the philtrum, that upper lip philtrum is involved. If that has eczema, that often is a marker. Again, this is just my observation, but that, that it may be malassezia related. So when I see that, I'll often say, let's try a little anti-yeast regimen. And sometimes it can be pretty dramatic. Other times it doesn't work. You know, some people said, no, it didn't seem to touch it at all, but it's sometimes worth it try because it's relatively safe. It's a non-steroidal and it's, again, a different approach, which is so refreshing. Sometimes you get stuck with just trying to smash the inflammation. If you could get one of the big triggers, and in this case, we think it's the yeast. If you could knock it down, that would be, it'd be amazing, and it can be transformative for people. Sure. Well, thank you guys both so much. That was more information than I could process. I can only imagine <laughs> watching. <laughs> um, it truly so grateful for your expertise and your support here. Um, and for those watching, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I'm sure you've thought of more. Um, I want to remind everybody that we record all of our sessions. So you'll get a video of this. Um, we'll get a link out as soon as it's up and on the web. But you can actually go back and watch all of our webinars from the past. So we had a biologics webinar, a topicals webinar, complementary and alternative. Um, you name it, we've we've done most of them at this point. Um, so please definitely go, always go back and check. You can see, find them under uh, resources on our website. There's a webinars link and you can find the archives there. And then uh, join us for our future webinar. Our next one will be with Dr. Brar from National Jewish Health in Denver. And she's presenting on the diagnostic and treatment challenges of eczema, some of which we covered today. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have our big eczema expo coming up June 21st through 24th in Chicago. We hope you will all join. Uh, you will definitely see Dr. Leo there. Um, we're putting him to work pretty much every day. <laughs> so come join us and um, learn more and meet your community and find the best ways to live with eczema. Um, and again, you can register starting now through Sunday with the code ASK412. That's the numbers 412412, today's date, uh, for a $50 discount on your registration. And I want to thank everyone again and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.